Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes with me, Katie Balls, your host for this week. The country has been hit by wide-ranging train strikes this week, which have made things relatively difficult for many commuters and even for some politicians. Will rail workers get what they want? I'll be joined for a political update by our team, James Forsyth and Isabel Hardman. Meanwhile, we're entering the fourth month of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Though Western sanctions have been extensive, they have had a mixed result as Kate Andrews looks in the cover. She'll be here to discuss this with me, alongside the economist Julian Jessup. One way that the West could help Ukraine is by providing more arms. That's the case Svetlana Morinets makes in this week's issue. She was a journalist in Ukraine, but is now a refugee in London and an intern at The Spectator. She'll join the show shortly. The pandemic hasn't just had financial repercussions. It has also opened up more doors for medical advancement. I'll be joined by the science journalist Matt Ridley and the oncologist Carol Sakura to discuss whether there is a vaccine around the corner when it comes to cancer. And finally, as we look ahead to a summer of travel disruption, with airlines and airports failing to keep up with demand, Jonathan Miller champions an unlikely solution, Ryanair. He'll be on the show shortly to tell us why he believes this budget airline is the best and most reliable option. A spectator subscription is now better value than ever. As a new subscriber joining today, you'll pay just £1 a week for unlimited online and app access in your first year. If you want the magazine delivered to your door, on top of that, it's only £1 a week extra, and your first month is free and without obligation. To subscribe today, go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. And why not also subscribe to our YouTube channel? Click the red subscribe button at the bottom of the video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. It's been a chaotic week so far as rail workers have gone on strike. But what are the political repercussions? I'm joined now by our political editor, James Forsyth, and assistant editor, Isabel Hardman. Isabel, James, thank you for joining Spectator TV today. Now, the big political story of the week has been strikes. The government did not manage to prevent them from happening, but yet there are some in Downing Street who don't think it's all so bad for them. James, who's currently feeling the political heat when it comes to the strikes? So all the strikes that we might have this summer, I think this rail strike is the easiest one for the government to deal with politically. Rail workers are relatively well paid, and it's the first bit of disruption this summer. And so the public kind of tolerance for it is fairly high. Uh, I think the challenge for the government comes if these strikes keep on happening, keep on going, uh, and, people, and voters move to, well, why can't you sort it out one way or the other? And the government has a vulnerability here because in its manifesto and in its first Queen's speech in 2019, it promised that it would legislate for minimum service uh, levels so that you couldn't have a rail strike that, that ground the entire network to pretty much to a halt, as has happened twice this week. And that hasn't happened, and that, that is a vulnerability for the government. For, for Labour, the, the, the issue is where do they stand on the strikes? So Keir Starmer said he didn't want any front benches out on picket lines, but inevitably there were some front benches out on picket lines. So, so, so what is his position on the strike, and he's, you know, what disciplinary action is he going to take against those front benches who disobeyed him? And Isabel, how is Keir Starmer dealing with that? Do you think his authority is being weakened by the fact some have not really paid attention to what he said on this? I think it has, and I think the approach that they're taking, which is to wait until the strikes are over and then discipline um, those who defied that instruction not to join picket lines. It, I mean, it does make sense because you don't want this sort of drip, drip of Labour sackings and rows and stuff. But but it's also partly a way of just kicking the can down the road for, for a little bit longer, um, because this is going to be really difficult for him to do. And uh, even though still a relatively small number of Labour MPs who went to on to picket lines, 25, I think it was. Um, the feeling in the wider party is still one of quite a lot of discomfort, actually, that he hasn't um, been more supportive of these strikers. And uh, it was very interesting. I was uh, talking to some of those around the Labour leader 
who I was really surprised uh, were very confident actually about uh, their position uh, opposing the strikes and um, uh, banning people from the picket lines. Uh, they said that uh, there were um, there were focus groups that the party held last week uh, where they tested the uh, the conservative message, which is these are Labour's strikes, and you know we've all seen those going out on the conservative uh, campaign emails. Um, we've seen them in, in in graphics that the conservatives have been putting out everywhere, uh, and so on. Um, but I'm told that in these internal focus groups, this message was largely laughed at by the voters, who felt it actually tapped into. Uh, the wider sense that Boris Johnson just is always trying to blame someone else. And actually, you know, the Labour Party aren't in power. So how are these their strikes, even if some of their members do support it? That's why Keir Starmer was quite happy to talk about the strikes at Prime Minister's Questions this week. But I don't think it's a happy Labour Party. And, and this is one of his problems, is that he doesn't have the, um, well, the, as Angela Rayner put it, the sort of, you know, he, doesn't give it as much welly as uh, other potential leaders might do. And so there's not that sort of groundswell of excitement about Keir Starmer that makes uh, other people in the party say, no, no, we've, you know, we've got to hold this line because we want to win and we'll just do what he says. Um, actually, there's a lot of worries about him much more widely than just his position on, on strikes. Now, it's going to get much harder for, for him and for the government um, as we head into... Um, the uh, the summer and the autumn, uh, the Conservatives are obviously heading for a summer of discontent, which is one of the things that he's hoping to exploit. Uh, but when does he say that Labour members, Labour MPs can join picket lines and when does he say that they can't? And does he end up sort of favouring certain workers over others, for instance? Uh, the government's going to really struggle um, if we get industrial action um, from nurses or teachers, but it's also going to be difficult for um, for the Labour Party as well. James, let's talk about the government's issues um, that Isabel just uh, referred to, particularly on public sector pay. Now, we expect there to be more strike action in different industries, and the government line and the line coming from Boris Johnson is there could be pay increases, but don't expect them to be in line with inflation, uh, which we expect to hit double digits, um, because this would be the wrong move and would make the problem worse. How tricky is that going to be to hold? I think it is going to be difficult to hold because public sector workers didn't get particularly big pay rises in uh, post-2010. It's one of the ways in which the, 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 the coalition government tried to kind of keep a lid on the public finances. And you've already seen the National Education Union saying that they want an inflation or above inflation pay rise for their members. Now, I don't think they're going to get that. But, you know, the, the, uh, a teacher's strike would be much more difficult and much more disruptive for the government to deal with than a, than a rail strike. And so the question becomes, you know, how do you do this? How do you find a way to avoid uh, uh, these big increases? Because I think it's also the fact is this, that, you know, a lot of private sector firms are looking to see what the government does. And if the government says you can have 8 or 9%, I think you'll see more private sector firms feeling uh, that they should follow suit. Uh, then there's a worry, but you, you hear from some secretaries of state, that unless they give relatively generous pay rises to, 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 to the workers in their sector, that they will leave, you know, that care home staff will go off to uh, work in a supermarket, for example. Uh, so I think this is, I think that you are, you are, there, are, there are going to be tensions over this policy. Uh, and it, it is an interesting test of how determined the government is to stick it out. Now, Isabel, we're speaking ahead of two by-elections, and when those results come through, we'll have all the coverage on Coffee House um, as we get it. Uh, but for now, um, speaking was ahead of what could be a, a storm for Boris Johnson, um, the mood in the Tory party. We have a situation where Boris Johnson is actually going to be in Rwanda um, when the results come through, and it comes after last week. He, at the last minute, um, well by the sense of those MPs on the ground at least, um, pulled out the Northern Research Group conference um, to go to Ukraine. I think he's been out of the country for over a week actually from today. Uh, so you have a situation where the Prime Minister is far away and I wondered, do MPs feel as though Boris Johnson is neglecting domestic duties or do they understand that he has international business to be getting on with? I mean, I think it's both in a sense because they do like um, uh, 
the relationship that Boris Johnson has with President Zelensky of Ukraine. Um, they, by and large, um, are very keen um, for uh, the government's Rwanda policy um, to go ahead. Now, obviously, that's not why he's in Rwanda. He's in Rwanda for the Commonwealth Heads of Government. But um, part of this trip has been choreographed so that he will have tea with Prince Charles, where he is expected, if the topic is raised, to say he's very proud of uh, the Rwanda policy. Um, so there's that. This is also, uh, I think, one of the longest foreign trips that uh, the Prime Minister has taken in one go. And I think, t to a certain extent, Conservative MPs feel he's quite remote even when he's back here. So I'm not sure that the geographical distance is, is necessarily the issue. Now, Northern Research Group MPs were obviously very offended um, by his decision to choose the day of their conference, which they were very excited about having him there for, um, to go to Ukraine. I have to say that um, some of that excitement was partly because I think some of them wanted to humiliate him um, in the question and answer session that he was going to have to do um, with the audience there um so perhaps you can understand why he decided to uh, to go somewhere uh probably more peaceful um than uh, than the conservative party but um but there is a, an issue with them feeling as though they're not being listened to which as we know is always an issue in the conservative party even in the best of times thank you isabel thank you james now, before we go ahead with the rest of the programme, I just want to tell you about the Spectator's Innovator of the Year Awards, which celebrates groundbreaking companies around the country. If you're an entrepreneur, please do apply at spectator.co.uk forward slash innovator. The closing date is the 4th of July. When the Russian invasion first began in February, many were shocked and impressed by the West's extensive and decisive sanctions. Surely all this will crumple Putin's economy and by extension, his authority. Yet, as we reach the fourth month of the war, that doesn't seem to be working out as planned. In her cover article for the magazine this week, Kate Andrews takes a look at the sanctions and asks why it hasn't worked as well as many hoped. She joins me now, together with the economist Julian Jessup, who has written for The Spectator on where the Russian economy is hurting. Thank you for joining us on Spectator TV, Kate and Julian. Kate, in this week's magazine, you look at Putin's billions and whether the sanctions by the West and other countries are really working. Can you give us a run through to begin with of what has been put on the table so far? So there have been a vast array of sanctions uh, coming from the West targeted at Russia, from freezing the accounts of notorious oligarchs to freezing Russian banks and companies out of the financial system. The goal has essentially been to push Russia and its economy uh, to the outer limits of the global economy and to keep them out of as much as possible. Uh, Putin's central bank assets, of which they're about $600 billion worth, about a third of those have, have managed to have been frozen by, by the international community because they're foreign assets. So quite a lot has been done. But what this article really looks at is, is arguably one of the most important sanctions that was not brought in early and in many places still hasn't been brought in, and that would be on Russia's energy. And without bringing in serious sanctions on Russian energy, what we've seen as this war has caused energy prices to spike, the cost of oil, the cost of gas all going up, is that Putin has actually been raking it in. At the moment, he's bringing in about $800 million a day, and about a fourth of that is coming from Germany alone. Uh, and so when you put that into perspective, we can talk about economic sanctions all we want, but the West is still very much funding Putin's war chest. Um, it's difficult for him to spend a lot of that money, and, and I think that's one area where you can argue that perhaps the sanctions are working. But, but the point of this article is that it really is a mixed picture, and if the goal was to completely cripple Russia's economy and to deprive Putin of these of, of his funds for his, for his war chest, arguably we have not been all that successful. Julian, do you think the sanctions could be backfiring? Hmm. Well, first of all, I think I agree with almost everything that Kate has, has just said. Um, I would say, though, that economic sanctions, I think, always going to play sort of second fiddle to the, the more important issue, which is making sure that Russia loses the war in Ukraine itself. And, you know, so far, the evidence is that militarily it's been a disaster for Russia. And I think that's probably the single most important thing at the moment. Um, as far as the economic sanctions are concerned, I agree that they've probably backfired in the in the short term, um, in the sense that 
they've actually sort of raised the the price of the key commodities that that Russia is selling. They've still been able to find good markets outside uh, Europe and the rest of the West. Um, but I think in the longer term, they will be far more effective. And I think that that is the bigger issue for for Russia. Um, yes, they've been able to sell some more energy and other commodities at higher prices now. But it's pretty clear that the long term tide is moving against them. You know, Europe will slowly uh, diversify away from from Russian oil and, and gas. And that's a big hit to the economy. Uh, on top of that, you've got all the, if you like, the softer stuff as well. So the, you know, the brain drain from, from Russia, the, the cultural isolation, all those sorts of things. Uh, they may not have much immediate impact on the, the headline economic numbers, but they're undoubtedly painful. Um, and the fact that so many people who have supported Putin more or less uh, explicitly over the last few years, the oligarchs, have been hit hard as well. I think there'll be some sort of price for, to pay for that in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, I think we have to be realistic and ask what the alternatives were. I mean, clearly, no sanctions against Russia would not have been acceptable. At uh, the other extreme, a complete ban on buying Russian oil and gas would have triggered an immediate recession in the West. So I think we had to be realistic. And personally, I think we've probably got the balance about right. Kate, how realistic is it for Germany to reduce its energy supply when it comes to Russia? Obviously, there's pressure uh, from other leaders for uh, the Germans to do this, but it is easier said than done. Oh, it's much easier said than done. But I think that's, that, that's one of the, the points of the piece, which is that um, the West wants to pat itself on the back and say, look at this amazing work we're doing. We've taken every step we can to be an ally of Ukraine. And the truth is we haven't taken every step we can, because for all the reasons that, that Julian just pointed out, um, you know, it, it is near impossible for, for Germany to overnight decide that it's no longer going to import Russian gas, not least because other countries that are more energy independent like the U.S. have not been especially helpful. Um, you know, there's been murmurs that the U.S. might help supply energy to, to countries like Germany, but we haven't really seen that come to fruition. So, um, you know, in, unless you want to essentially damn your society to, to the lights going out in a recession overnight, it's not possible. But, you know, that phrase just keeps coming to my mind. This is the one thing we didn't want to have happen. And the fact that Putin is expected to bring in more income this year in 2022 when he launched his full scale invasion than he did last year was clearly not the point of these sanctions. And I think we, we need a more honest conversation around it. I completely agree with Julian that in the medium to long term, this is going to be extremely painful for Russia. And actually in the short term, their economy is expected to contract by 10% this year, 4% next year. Whilst the growth figures and the predictions for the West don't look great, they're nothing as bad as that. And Putin is starting to take some very dangerous uh, decisions and he's playing some very dangerous games by threatening to cut off food exports from Ukraine's port in Odessa, threatening, you know, starting to, to, to play with how much gas he's actually importing to Europe, you know, suggesting, look, I can turn off the taps if I want to. Um, the result, if, if, if he gets very serious about either of those things, is, is that people will die from, uh, from the cold and from starvation. These are really serious games and, and he's playing them because of the sanctions. He wants to see them disappear. They are hurting Russia. There's no doubt about that. Um, but he is, in, in my opinion, in the short term, a stronger position when it comes to European energy in particular. We have found ourselves in a position, in part because of these sanctions, in which Europe is more dependent on Russian gas than Russia is for, for European cash and that income because he's had such a windfall of profits in the first half of this year. Julian, what options are there really for these countries like Germany and the West when it comes to uh, things they could do which would perhaps make these sanctions more effective, but also not uh, you know, backfiring so much that there's suddenly this uh, big domestic backlash, which you touched on? Well, actually, one thing to say first is that even if Russia is in some sense winning the, the sanctions war in the short term, it's very much a, a hollow victory. Um, if we take the, the Russian ruble, for example, the currency, um, that has strengthened to something like a, a seven year high against the US dollar, which is, is quite remarkable. Um, but that's been at the cost of a, a combination of you know, significant capital controls uh, in Russia itself. And also a collapse in domestic demand. So yes, Russia is still getting lots of money coming in from selling commodities to the West and also to countries like China and India. 
Um, but at the same time, it's not able to import much from the West, uh, things that it wants, everything from military goods to consumer goods and so on and so on. So um, that has propped up the balance of payments, which at face value looks extremely healthy. But underlying that, there are deep structural problems in the in the Russian economy that aren't going to go away anytime soon. Um, and I think that's probably the, the way that countries like, like Germany should be looking at this. I mean, um, you know, ideally, we in, in the UK or others in the US might like Germany to, to cut off um, imports of energy from Russia straight away. But um, I simply don't think that's realistic. There are lots of countries, Germany is one, Italy is another, who rely on Russia for maybe sort of 40 percent of their um, energy, particularly things like natural gas. And you can, simply cannot find alternative sources of energy that quickly, uh, even with the, the best will in the world. So I think we have to accept that some countries like Germany and Italy are always going to be behind the pack in terms of reducing their dependency on, on Russian energy. Um, but importantly, they are signalling their willingness to do so over the medium to longer term. Um, and that is having a, a big impact. If you look at, for example, you know, Russian equity market, that, that's still pretty depressed because they're taking you know, a longer term view of the viability of the Russian economy and the energy model in particular. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, Germany and Italy and the others need to do more now, but they're absolutely right that they should be signaling their intention uh, to reduce their dependency on Russian energy over time. And I think that's where most of the damage will come. And Kate, if we look at the illustration of this week's spectator, ultimately it's Putin surrounded by all this gold. Um, but even if he is, uh, you know, raking it in more than he would be doing uh, without the sanctions when it comes to some of that revenue, he is limited, as Julian mentioned, on what he can actually spend it on. And for example, with things such as um, the war and getting the right military equipment, it is going to be quite tricky for him to use that money in a way which gets him exactly what he needs, isn't it? Yes, and I think that's uh, the flip side of this, where you can say that sanctions are, are having their effects. Uh, it is going to be increasingly difficult for Putin to import the, the military equipment he needs. He's already finding it very hard to get uh, high-tech artillery back into Russia. Uh, and to Julian's original point about you know what we care about most, Ukraine actually winning this war, it's estimated by UK figures that Russia has already lost a third of its ground force that has sent into Ukraine uh, since it began this war. And, and that includes uh, a thousand military vehicles, it includes a hundred planes. That's going to be very hard for him to, to, to get back into uh, his military. Uh, as well, you know, he, he's been known for years to be working with Russian businessmen to smuggle in microchips that are necessary for military operations, but patrols are increasing. It's getting harder to uh, circumvent, uh, you know, U.S. exports and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, this is an area where in the medium term, he is definitely going to be feeling that pain. But because he does have access to so much cash and he's using a lot of that to stimulate artificially the Russian economy, what it can buy him is time. And that is a very real concern, especially as, you know, I'm I understand Julian's point about, you know, we need, to, we need to be accepting that Germany can't wean itself off Russian gas overnight, but I'm slightly less generous uh, to Chancellor Schultz uh, and, and the government in Germany right now because there's been a lot of talk of sending Ukraine weapons and more military supplies and the Ukrainians are saying we haven't seen this yet. Um, you certainly get a sense from Germany that, that they would prefer for this to end sooner rather than later. And you don't always get the sense um, that, that they feel very strongly how that has to end because this is causing so much domestic pain. Um, so as long as Putin has that time and he's able to artificially stimulate his own economy, I think that's really bad news for Ukraine winning this war. And Julian, in terms of time frame, Kate's touching on obviously the pressure, how, how the current situation could give Putin time. For these sanctions to be really successful, do you think they have to stay in place for, for a long time to come? Uh, well, yes, I do. I think the obvious thing to do is to keep them in place as long as Putin is in power. Um, I think it's very hard to, to see uh, the West re-engaging with, with Russia as long as Putin is in power. And presumably as long as Putin is in power, Russia will hold on to whatever parts of Ukraine it's, it's already taken. Um, so I think that we have to be in this for the, for the long haul. As, um, as Kate said, this is, this is very difficult to do. I think it's probably easier for us to do in, in, in the UK and possibly also in, in the US than it is for, for some European countries. But I, I agree with Kate, there's some worrying signs of, 
you know, backsliding. Uh, Kate picked on Germany. I'm going to pick on France, where you know President Macron seems to take the view that we shouldn't, you know, do much to upset Putin. Um, I hate to throw around words like appeasement, but it, it does feel like that. That you know, some countries are are too concerned about the potential uh, blowback on their own economies to uh, to take on somebody who is, you know, clearly a, a murderous tyrant who's doing. You know, lots of harm to his neighbours, but also even to his own country. So um, I think politically, it's going to be very difficult for all countries to stay the course against uh, Russia and continue with the sanctions. But frankly, I think we have to, we have to until there's a, a regime change in Russia itself. And Kate, just finally, um, touching on those points, um, we have a situation where there's clearly concern among some governments that there is backsliding uh, by other European leaders. Um, as, as we just had Macron's idea that, that Putin should not be humiliated uh, and so forth. So is this going to be a case when it comes to sanctions of, of who blinks first? Yeah, I think so. Um, we have this dynamic where we have a shrinking Russian economy and, uh, as Julian said, a, a murderous tyrant who's sitting on cash and time but is struggling to spend that cash and at some point may start to run out of time. But you also have Western governments um, that are looking at very stagnant economic growth, dealing with a cost of living crisis across the West um, in which people are getting very frustrated and very angry. We have an inflation crisis on our hands too. And there is a question as to who can sustain this longer. Um, and you do hear worrying um, murmurs from, from Europe that you know perhaps we're going to have to come to some uh, uh, faster solution um, and what that actually means for Ukraine and for the sovereignty of Ukraine and for the safety of Ukrainian people doesn't always feel like it's at the forefront of that discussion. So, you know, we always have to be realistic when we consider this and, um, you know, realistic in, in what kinds of negotiations might happen, realistic in time frames. Um, but uh, if the West blinks first and, and blinks quickly and rapidly, um, you could certainly find yourself in a situation where Putin isn't just gaming the economic sanctions. He actually also manages to game the military situation between Russia and Ukraine. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Julian. So, as this talk of certain leaders looking to backslide on their commitments when it comes to sanctions, what is the situation like in Ukraine? Why is it that the Ukrainians want to keep fighting? To discuss this, I'm now joined by Svetlana Moronets. She writes about what can be done to help the Ukrainian side in this week's magazine. She was a journalist based in Ukraine, but she is now in the UK as a refugee, and she is also an intern at The Spectator. She writes about why Ukrainians like her family, who are still there, want to keep fighting. Svetlana, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV today. You write for the magazine this week about why Ukrainians plan to keep fighting rather than go for a negotiated settlement. Why is it important to you? Oh, it's a complicated question, but uh, my family is there, my friends are there. Uh, all the people that I know and I love and they as me think that we should keep fighting because if not, if we try to negotiate with Putin and give up some territories, uh, eventually he will come back with a stronger army. So we have been fighting this war for eight years and only now we've got a chance to win because all the last eight years we were fighting alone with uh, so few uh, weapons and with Minsk agreements that didn't allow us actually to make the offense and make our territories free. So right now we can fight back and, and I think we should use this chance as fast as we can until West still is still supporting us. And do you think Ukrainians have reason not to trust Putin when it comes to any negotiation? <laughs> yes, for sure, because every time when we were trying to negotiate with him, we had to make concessions. Uh, and after that, anyway, he was breaking them and or attacking our army or how it happened now uh, he made he began a full-scale war 
and we saw that Minsk agreements never worked actually and they just helped to like unofficially recognize Crimea as Russian but for Ukraine anything worked and our soldiers even couldn't shoot back when Russians were shelling us on Donbass because uh, we couldn't break Minsk agreements but for Putin and his army it was allowed. I think it is a little bit unfair. <laughs> And do you worry about your father, for example? You, you say he could be brought into the army. Um, would he have the right equipment? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm terrified that they can call him up to the army and I have to buy him an, an equipment if they do it because there is not enough equipment and even with western support it is not enough ukraine called up to the army already one million of people and we don't have enough um, special this protection that they use uh, that soldiers use and mostly volunteers bring them and people are donating money and I'm thinking that if they call my father, yes, I will have to buy him body armor by myself. It's one of the reasons why I'm working in the UK, <laughs> because that's pretty expensive. <laughs> um, yet, despite this, you, you believe Ukrainians should keep fighting. What do you think would happen if Zelensky tried to agree to some peace deal? It depends, but mostly I think that if he agrees to a peace deal that is not good for Ukraine, for example, giving up some territories, he might be overthrown as soon as democracy comes back. And he knows that because once Ukrainians already uh, kicked out the president in back in 2013 uh, when we had Maidan revolution and it was only because he uh, decided not to sign the association with the European Union and instead to make agreements with Russia and the same now after eight years of war and 45,000 people dead, it, it is before 24 of February, now this number is much bigger. Uh, we don't want any negotiations. Uh, the only option for us is when we throw out Russian army uh, from our borders, as it was before, uh, we bring back all our territories and after we negotiate as a winner and we make our points and our rules and i think it is the only exact acceptable thing for ukrainians because otherwise we will have to make concessions if we are not in a good position for example now now we can't negotiate because the war on the east right now is horrible and as Ukrainian army lacks weapons, we received only 10% of what we were asking for. We don't have good chances right now for negotiating. And that's why we have to wait till we get something. For example, as we didn't let Putin to take Kyiv. We were in a stronger position, but right now, as he occupied almost whole Lugansk region, it's not a good thing for us for negotiating. Thank you, Svetlana, for your time today. Now, if you want to hear more from Svetlana, she is penning a daily Ukraine update in our Lunchtime Expresso newsletter. To sign up, visit spectator.co.uk forward slash expresso. Remember, if you enjoy Spectator TV, you can subscribe to the magazine and to our online content. Join today and you'll pay just £1 a week for unlimited online access in your first year. If you want the magazine delivered to your door on top of that, it's only £1 a week extra. And your first month is free and without obligation. To subscribe today, go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. Now for a spot of good news.
In the near future, we may have vaccines for cancer. Scientists are currently researching the potential for mRNA technology to enable jabs that will allow the body to identify and attack cancer cells. Matt Ridley, author of How Innovation Works, writes about this development in this week's issue and joins me now to give Professor Carol Sakura, oncologist and former chief of the cancer program at the World Health Organization. Matt, you write in this week's magazine that we could be on the verge of a breakthrough when it comes to the war on cancer, as Nixon called it. Can you talk us through what's going on? Well, the most recent announcement came from uh, BioNTech, the German company that developed a a vaccine against COVID. Um, And it showed promising results with an experimental vaccine against uh, pancreatic cancer, albeit very premature. But it's part of I think what looks like a a step change in cancer treatment, which is greatly improved and personalized immunotherapy, where you get the body to attack the cancer, um, uh, do do the job of attacking the cancer itself, and do so in an increasingly personalized way. Um, And uh, while I don't think this is a cure for cancer or the cure for cancer or the end of the war on cancer or anything like that, I think it's right to be modestly hopeful that things are going to improve quite rapidly in terms of the ability to survive cancer. Carol, when we're talking about this, uh, I think it's talking about potential vaccine being used uh, in uh, the fight against cancer. Do you think there's a cause for cautious optimism here? I really do. I think it's really a spillover from COVID days. The mRNA vaccines were first used for COVID. There are two, uh, one made by BioN and one made by Moderna, and they got the technology right. Now, it's much trickier to make a vaccine for cancer than it is for a virus. And the reason for that, it's our cells, the cancer of cells that arise from our own body, and therefore look pretty similar to the immune system. So, mRNA vaccines, when you put some cancer antigens, some proteins or some other molecule that is expressed by the mRNA that mimics the cancer and drives the immune system, the T cells and maybe B cells, to the cancer, could be effective. I mean, immunotherapy has been around 100 years. I did a PhD in it a long time ago, over 40 years ago, and it's, it's elusive. But over the last five years, it's become much closer with a group of drugs called checkpoint inhibitors that have transformed the treatment of melanoma, renal cell, kidney cancer, and a variety of other cancers. But this is something, as as Matt says, personal. Uh, You can actually take uh, genes from a person's cancer and devise a vaccine to those specific abnormal genes that have arisen. And in that way, hopefully control it. And as Matt says, a small study, 16 patients, five of whom had rather surprising time after surgery before they developed recurrence. It's not curative yet, but it's the hint that this should work if we get it right. And Matt, if uh, eventually this did go right, um, science, Would there be quite a few complications then in terms of rolling this out on a mass level for some of the reasons we've just heard? Yes, because as Carol says, the the key issue is the personalised nature of this medication. You're going to develop a vaccine for one patient. Now, you know, it costs a lot to develop a vaccine. So if if you had to sort of prove its safety and efficacy uh, for one patient, it's obviously astronomically expensive. But... Uh, Nonetheless, there are ways in which you can think of it as a fairly standardized procedure. After all, um, developing the lipid nanoparticle in which the vaccine is delivered uh, is a standard product. Um, Likewise, the ingredients of DNA are standard products, or RNA in this case. So there's every reason to think that it, it ought to be possible to make these relatively affordable and to know they're safe in general without having a very specific question asked about the specific one that you're doing for the specific patient. Um, all, the, all the same, I suspect, and I'd be very interested to hear what Carol's got to say about this, I suspect we're going to hit an affordability crisis in cancer um, in the coming years where uh, yes, there are 
very effective cures, but no, they're not um, cheap. And uh, how we solve that uh, is going to get interesting. I think, you know, white powders in bottles are the pharmaceutical dream that you have a powder for every illness, including cancer. And that's it. You have pancreatic cancer, you take this powder. You have breast cancer, you have another powder. Very simple. But the future isn't like that. It's going to be about personalizing the medication, as we can see here. Specific series of antigens are expressed on a cancer. We have to get the genes out for those antigens put them into an RNA molecule, and then get that to be expressed with the vector and everything, the lipid packaging and all the rest of it. And that's going to cost, And uh, but it can be automated. Uh, as Matt says, a lot of the, the steps are sort of automated and they were driven by COVID and the urgency of it. The safety testing of RNA has been driven by COVID. I mean, millions of people have had these vaccines. Uh, whereas, you know, two years ago, nobody had had these. Even I've had them. I don't know what one you had, Matt, but I certainly had the Pfizer vaccine. So uh, I, I think the future is about understanding cancer at a molecular level and then developing specific therapies. You know, when I do a clinic, Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Smith have exactly the same type of cancer, but the treatment is almost, the best treatment is probably different. But, and I don't know how to choose that on the whole. The time will come when you will be able to choose it. You, not only that, you'll know whether immunotherapy would be of value. So although it may be more costly, you won't waste drugs on people that aren't going to respond. So I think the future is about personalization. And, uh, and I'm optimistic that as Matt says in his article, you know, when I started as a doctor a long time ago now, uh, about 26% of people were cured of cancer. Now uh, it, it's 49%, nearly 50% in some environments. So I think things have changed and you don't notice that change. And I think this sort of development, personalized treatment for cancer will make further changes. My experience was was interesting, and I think quite typical of people I've talked to, which is that I tolerated the um, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines for my first two uh, doses extremely well, but the Moderna booster knocked me back for a few hours only, but gave me tremendous shivering chills as if I had malaria for a few hours. I went to bed with seven layers on and couldn't get warm. Now that was no big deal; I was over it, as I say, by dinner time. But um, uh, when I then read up on the uh, RNA vaccines, I found that uh, the, their problem had been getting the body to not overreact to the lipid particle in which the vaccine comes. And that had taken them a number of years to get right. Um, so how how experimental are these vaccines still? Because you hear a lot of people, particularly in the USA, saying um, vaccines are okay, but I don't trust these new RNA vaccines. I personally think that they're a wonderful new invention and they're going to um, transform the, the speed of development of vaccines, if nothing else. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in whether or not there is a problem with side effects that, that needs to be tackled. I think the short-term side effects, as you described, that you had uh, are fairly common, but as you say, inconsequential long term. Perhaps more worrying with RNA vaccines, can the RNA insert itself in some way in the, in the host genome of normal cells? If it can, then is there a cancer risk 30 years down the line? And that that's the biggest worry. Not so much if you're treating cancer with it, because the, the, the risk benefit is much greater to do something. But for vaccination purposes, for a disease for most people is relatively minor, such as COVID. Millions of people have been vaccinated with RNA vaccines. And will some of those have a higher cancer incidence because of it? So the doom mongers say, perhaps. Uh, uh, the, the more positive people say, well, it's a risk, but we have to learn to live with it. And I think the treatment of preventing vaccinating for infectious disease you really have to have things that are really safe. And it was COVID that drove the drive to get vaccines with RNA quickly, because it was the only way you could get it quickly. The Oxford was a, 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 an alternative virus, a totally different product, traditional. Um, you know, what I've seen in my professional career is 
polio, diphtheria, tetanus, all gone because of the effect, efficacy of vaccines. Uh, and then you get cancer where we just don't have effective treatment for around half the patients. So can we get it out of this type of technology? And certainly the, the benefits outweigh the risks in a cancer patient. So I think here it's a good place to experiment with different structures for vaccines. Matt, for the reasons we just heard, do you think we could see some vaccine hesitancy um, if these were eventually you know, offered as widespread treatments? Of course, the pandemic uh, is responsible for a breakthrough, but it did lead to some actually, you know, really turning against vaccines. Well, I, I am concerned by the degree of um, anti-vax sentiment I come across uh, in the wake of the pandemic. Um, a lot of it completely specious. Um, I don't know who's responsible? Was it the fact that there was an anti-vax movement before this, which has jumped on the bandwagon? Um, or is it partly because um, people feel they've been uh, 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 rushed into these vaccines um, uh, rather than, you know, as it were, taken taken with them? And I, I did, a, you know, I, I urged government ministers early on in the pandemic to to not say these are 100% safe, you know, to, 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 to say to people, of course, there are risks, but they're worth running. And I think that that is the right way to go. Um, uh, but it, you know, if you're, if you have a diagnosis of a cancer that is likely to kill you, and the doctor says, I've got an injection I can give you, which is likely to cure you, I don't think many people are going to hesitate. And Carol, I wondered, picking up on something you said earlier, I just wondered in layman's terms, if you could just give us a quick explanation as to why it is that ultimately cancer is so prevalent, but has been so tricky to overcome when it comes to medical interventions compared with other um, illnesses. So it's partly because cancer is the enemy within. It's our own cells that have gone wrong. They're difficult to, um, if, if, you know, you can kill cancer cells in a Petri dish so easily. You just pour Domestos on them or some disinfectant, they die. But you can't do that in the body. They are just so similar. And uh, they're like terrorists. They're rogue cells. You can't pick them up. There's no way of identifying them easily. I think what's likely to happen over the next decade is we're going to get better at understanding the cancer risk in people uh, and therefore tailoring screening programs to cancer risk and therefore using preventive strategies as well to try and reduce the risk of getting cancer. Cancer is very age related and people forget this. The reason cancer is going up in all Western countries is people are living longer. So if you've got more of your population over 60, you've got a much higher cancer incidence if there's less of your population over 60. And we're seeing the shift now in poorer countries as well, in Africa, where because of the control of infection, there are more people developing cancer. So uh, they still have infection. And in some countries, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria are dominating the population. And now as we get improvements in the treatment of those diseases, you end up with a much higher cancer incidence as people live longer. So you can't deny living longer is the aim of good medicine, but it does bring with it significant problems. And uh, I think Although the future you, is going to... You know, I was just going to say, there's a tiny silver lining, which I write about in my book, which is that once you get past 90, um, cancer rates start dropping again. And past 100, they're surprisingly low. I mean, you know, centenarians very rarely suffer from cancer and very rarely die of cancer. And this seems to be, Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, um, because your metabolism's so slow that the tumor just can't can't get going or at least can't spread. And I think that's right. And also the fact that the cancer cells themselves are the same age as you, by definition, they've risen from cells the same age as you. So they have slowed down in old age. And it's true. I mean, if you take breast cancer, uh, you know, breast cancer in ladies over 90 is a fairly benign disease. Most people with breast cancer over 90 don't die of their disease. It doesn't have a chance to spread. And it's easily controlled by hormones, uh, just tamoxifen, a very old-fashioned type of hormone uh, drug. And it controls it. 
And yet in young women, you see people you know, with very aggressive disease within three months going from being completely well to being seriously ill. So I think there's a lot of inexplicable factors in cancer. And again, this means we do have to personalize treatments, not just by age, but also by molecular characteristics of the cancer. And just finally, Carol, I wondered, obviously different cancers uh, have different treatments and there are some cancers such as pancreatic where the survival rates are, are very stark and, and worrying still. Do you think we could get to a point in the, in the next few decades where um, you know, when you hear that cancer diagnosis, it, it stops being a, a death sentence really um, for, for many, many people? I think more likely it, it'll get gradually better from 25% to 50% in one professional lifetime is, is pretty good going. Uh, the reason it's unlikely to disappear completely is evolution. Cancer cells are evolution in miniature. Darwin came up with the concept of natural selection and mutation. That's what cancer cells are good at. They mutate, and those that are more successful in outwitting the drugs we give or the immune system stimulation we give will outwit those and, and start growing again. So it's a dynamic evolution. We'll never be in a world without cancer. That was going to be a slogan of the old Imperial Cancer Research Fund when I was on the board. It was going, living in a world without cancer. And it's just not achievable. They never used the slogan. We said that was a, it's not possible to live in a world without cancer, but we can decrease the serious consequences of what can be a devastating disease. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Matt. And finally, with airport disruption set to continue for the rest of the summer, could Ryanair be the answer? Jonathan Miller champions the budget airline in this week's issue, suggesting that it is in fact far superior to British Airways and Virgin Atlantic. He joins me on the show now. Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us on Spectator TV this week. Um, in this week's magazine, you say that Ryanair is horrible, but it is still the best flight service in Europe. Can you explain why? Well, you know, I think grading airlines is a relative matter. And I wouldn't say that I, you know, anticipate my flights on Ryanair with the enthusiasm that I recall for those old, the old days of going on to British Airways and in the days when women wore hats to fly and men would wear ties and it was a glamorous, a glamorous affair. But nowadays when travel is, uh, is, is, is really kind of brutal and you have to put up with these overcrowded lounges and endless formalities. Um, and uh, it, it, it boils down to really something very simple. What does it cost? And will your plane actually take off? And when you come home, will it actually be there to pick you up? And on those two points, Ryanair scores without any question better than any of its competitors and therefore uh Ryanair is really my first choice I have I make the tra the trajet between uh Bézier and London very very frequently and I paid as little you won't believe this as two euros two euros to fly from Bézier to uh, to Stansted although I admit that by the time I selected a seat the price had gone to nine euros so that seems to me a pretty good uh, offering. And we're looking ahead to a summer of travel chaos. I think some have already experienced uh, some of that chaos. Um, but what's really interesting in your piece is how you uh, look at the figures. And actually, it appears that despite Ryanair su sort of suffering from low expectations, it ultimately appears to be doing a better job at taking off and potentially getting you there on time compared to other aircraft carriers such as British Airways and EasyJet. Well, it's certainly, according to the, the metrics that I have seen, Ryanair is by far the most uh, reliable airline in Europe. And uh, the least reliable is KLM, which is a full service airline with fares to match. And the British Airways and EasyJets of the world are all sort of mid-table. Uh, but we've read these horror stories of British Airways passengers stranded without baggage for days and days and days. 
and uh, people flying off on holiday and not being able to get back. But although Ryanair is a, is a favorite butt of all jokes, um, I'd rather crash it. Uh, at Heathrow than land at Stansted. The reality is it offers a predictable service at an agreeable price. And you have to say that one reason for that is because of Michael O'Leary, uh, uh, Michael O'Leary who, who, uh, who is quite ruthless um, in negotiating with his suppliers. Uh, in, indeed, I would nominate him to run British Rail. That might be a solution to another problem. Yes, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about Michael O'Leary because you. Um... Well, he's a he's a he's a disputatious character. He's a tough guy. I mean, he he he's a he's a kind of genius for publicity. He once suggested that he would charge his passengers to use the the, the loo on the aeroplane. He he I, maybe this was a joke. Uh, it's part of part of his his. Uh, his his thing that you don't really know when he's joking or he said why do we why do we need seats on our planes why don't we just let people hang on straps he he suggested at one point why am i paying two pilots i don't need a co-pilot if 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 the if the, if the captain gets sick why don't i just get one of the flight attendants to uh, to land the plane so he's got a a proven track record of being a provocateur but it seems to have worked because he's now got you know close to 500 or maybe a little more than 500 aircraft in the air. And uh, while he is unable to do much about alleviating the misery of Stansted or Luton, um, certainly uh, he's there when you need him. And you mentioned Stansted, reading your piece, I have to say, when you talked about those Heathrow snobs, I feel you might have been referring to, to someone like me in terms of my airport preference. Um, so although we're talking about cheap flights, if you do end up uh, landing in some uh, further out, such as Stansted, Luton, don't you then have to price in the fact it's going to cost you more to get to where you need to go after? Well, I don't know. I just uh, did a, a, a Liverpool Street to uh, Stansted uh, train journey. Um, and uh, you, A, you get the benefit of, of seeing beautiful Essex. But B, I think it's probably half the price of the, of the train from Paddington to Heathrow. Um, so, you know, I clearly uh, you trade um, convenience. You cl you trade, you know, those little amenity bags with with the silly eye shields that you get, you know, on business class in British Airways. But I, you know, for most people, including me, um, the idea of paying, you know, ten euros for a flight compared to ten times that price on a on a you know, brand name airline is uh, is an overwhelming argument, and uh, you can spend your time on the train reflecting on how much money you're saving. Uh, and having to ha and having to have recently had booked quite a few flights has been uh, a bit horrifying to see how much prices are jumping. So I imagine lots of people are thinking, where should we go instead? So I wondered, Jonathan, if uh, you know we imagine some viewers are yet to experience the delights of Ryanair the sales pitch you've given today has worked. Have you got any top tips for how um, they should prepare for that flight and what they should or shouldn't do once on it? Well, I think, you know, airports are triggering for me. I, I, I you know, it brings out my inner misanthrope and I think that's true with a lot of people. So I think you have to prepare by just having a rather Zen attitude um, and, uh, but there's, you know, the horror of Ryanair is actually not really when you get on the plane. It's when you're waiting in that departures area at Stansted with all of humanity. Uh, you know, on the one hand, one can applaud uh, Michael O'Leary, who's democratized air travel and opened up new horizons to a whole group of people whose previous experience of, of travel might have been limited to, to a, a charabank for a a uh, week in Scunthorpe. Um, uh, but the, the corollary of that is that these uh, airports are really kind of a horror story, especially on the London end. Although when you get to a little, you know, he, he does tend to fly to these secondary airports around Europe, which are op often quite uh, quite tr tranquil in comparison. Uh, often they, they are not particularly close to the city they claim to be, 
when you fly on Rhino to Paris, you end up in a place called Beauvais, which might as well be halfway to Calais. When you fly to Frankfurt, and you're practically in Austria. I, I exaggerate only a little. But if you can put up with that, and you say, uh, you know, this is how it is. Um, I think it's perfectly acceptable. I think we should uh, we should uh, honor Michael O'Leary and invite him to in, in, back to Britain, to Britain to run British Rail. Maybe he can sort that out. And just finally, Jonathan, while we have you here, you're joining us from France. And this week we've had, obviously, uh, the results uh, in the French elections relating to how Macron will govern. And I just wondered if uh, you could give us an update on what, what the mood is where you are, because it seems as though Emmanuel Macron's had a bit of a disaster. Well, it, I think it has been a disaster, as, I, as I've written for uh, the Coffee House the Spectator blog, and as uh, many of the other contributors of The Spectator in France, it really is a, a, a kind of political uh, fall to earth for Jupiter, who's um, he's met something of, of a Waterloo. He's got a, he's got a, a government that's a lamed, a lamed up government that's not even a month old. He's got a prime minister, Elizabeth Bourne, who looks like having the shortest tenure since the only, her only female predecessor, Edith Cresson, who called memorably English men homosexuals and Japanese ants, um, she's already offered to resign. He hasn't accepted it. And that's because he hasn't decided what to do next. He's having talks in the Elysee, but he hasn't appeared in public. He hasn't explained or acknowledged that this result is entirely the consequence of his own arrogance, I would say even narcissism. He was elected president under this curious system put in place by General de Gaulle uh, to, uh, to always steer the vote towards the most moderate uh, candidate. Um, but he's not, not been liked here from the very first year of his presidency when he triggered the, uh, the, the Gilets Jaunes movement by raising fuel prices and lowering the wealth tax simultaneously. Um, he's been a very divisive figure and uh, uh, quite a disagreeable figure. He, uh, he, in some ways, you think he's uh, on the spectrum. He, he has a very hard time relating with ordinary voters, and he seems to spend a lot of time avoiding them. I think he made a huge mistake by thinking that his re-election was some kind of in, you know, endorsement of him, when it's proven that he's really is unpopular, has been unpopular, and looks like continuing to be unpopular by, by prancing around the world stage, uh, declaring his ambitions to build this, this greater Europe, when my neighbours are more interested in, in the price of diesel and, and food. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Katie. Bye. That's it for this week. Remember, if you enjoy what we do here at The Spectator, you can subscribe to the magazine and to our online content. Join today and you'll pay just £1 a week for unlimited online app access in your first year. If you want the magazine delivered to your door on top of that, it's only £1 a week extra and your first month is free and without obligation. To subscribe today, go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week. Mm -hmm.